Hello and welcome to this lecture on channel capacity encoding. Let us first start with the outline of today's talk. We will revisit this concept of channel capacity which we discussed in the previous lecture. Then we will look at a class of channels called symmetric channels and also weakly symmetric channels and find out that it is quite easy to figure out the capacity of such symmetric channels. Then we will revisit noisy channel coding theorem and we will look at a very simple example, one of the simplest example of an error control code which is the repetition code. And finally, we will talk about Gaussian channels which are very practical and also mathematically tractable. And we will sp sprinkle some examples here and there wherever required. So, let us start with a quick recap of what we did in the previous class. Um, we started with a very basic channel model called the binary symmetric channel. Even though it is simple, we can have several practical channels represented as binary symmetric channel, including for example, the satellite channel. Now, let us look at this structure. We always have a channel encoder whose job is to add redundancy in a known manner so as to overcome the ill effects of the channel. Then we need to transmit the bit stream over the channel and therefore, we have a modulator. So, in this case we are writing it as a binary modulator, but it could be a general MRE modulator. The job of this modulator is to take in bits and convert it into a waveform. Because we live in an analog world, even though we love to deal with digital data. The channel, it could be any channel, the wireless channel, the underwater channel, the telephone line, the fiber optic channel, whatever channel you choose would require the waveform to be transmitted over the channel. Now, the bits could be represented as amplitude or phase or frequency or a combination in terms of the wireless channel or even amplitude or wavelength for fiber optic channel. So, you can have several ways to indicate whether you are transmitting a 1 or a 0. Of course, the inherent part of this channel is the noise and rest of this lecture will be dealing with reliable communication over this channel in the presence of noise. When we say that the channel has noise, we say it is an unreliable channel. So, even though we are sending a 1 or a 0 or a 0 1 over this channel, what we receive what the demodulator gives us is likely to be in error. Well, depends on how good your luck is and how bad the channel is, but most of the ones and zeros will come out as a 1 and a 0, but some of them will be in error. Then the channel decoder starts its job, its job is to ensure that it can correct from the errors and if it has been designed correctly, it will recover from some of the errors. Today, by the end of this lecture, we will look at a simple channel encoder and decoder a channel code called the repetition code. Now, we looked at this discrete memoryless channel where you can have 0, 1, 2 up to small q minus 1 possible input symbols and output could be y 0, y 1 up to y capital Q minus 1 output possible output symbols. Now, what could they be? Well, for me, this could be frequency 1, frequency 2 up to frequency q minus 1 and output could also be frequencies or voltages or intensities. So, it is for you to choose, but there are distinct symbols at the input and output. The input and output are linked. You can see there is a, an arrow connecting each one of the nodes at the input to the node at the output and we can write a transition probability. Right? 
So, it tells you what is the probability that when x 0 was transmitted, it landed up as y 0, but it has a probability of also showing up as y 1 or being decoded as y q minus 1. So, it will be indicated by this probability matrix. So, let us spend a minute on this channel transition matrix. We will learn that it has several names, but the conditional probabilities that characterize a discrete memoryless channel can be arranged in a matrix form. So, this capital P is a, a set of P j i s and it connects the input to the output. P is called the probability transition matrix and it is sometimes also referred to by different names like transition probability matrix or channel transition matrix or channel transition probability matrix depending on how uh, upbeat you are about writing the whole thing, you can use one of these three uh, avatars of this channel transition matrix. Now, just for wireless channels, let us spend some time looking at the various channel types. Please note that this is a jump from what we were doing. Here we have four varieties like the single input, single output channel. So, here the input and output simply means that the number of antenna elements we have at the transmitter and the receiver side. Within the CISO, I can have a channel transition probability matrix. So, let us look at this graphically. Suppose we have an antenna at the transmitter and we have an antenna at the receiver. it is a wireless channel. So, we have single input, single output, a CISO channel. Now, within this channel, I can choose to have certain number of possible inputs x and possible number of inputs y and they are connected together and I can have an equivalent channel probability matrix that links the input to the output for a CISO channel. But wireless gives us possibilities. So, we can be imaginative and suppose we put more than one antenna element at the transmitter. So, if I have multiple input, but a single receiver, single output, I make it as MISO. And this kind of a configuration is possible when we have suppose a small form factor at the receiver. For example, this could be my handheld mobile phone and this is my base station. I can have several antennas available there. Now, again for this pseudo channel, we can have a transition probability matrix available for this and so and so forth for this and so and so forth for this. At the same time, we can choose to have a much larger number of transmit antennas and also much larger number of receive antennas. and I can have this as 1, 2, up to n, 1, 2, up to m and they are also linked. So, this is multiple input, multiple output 
MIMO systems. The reason why these are very popular in the current wireless um, standards is because they give us diversity gain. Wireless channels are inherently hostile and it is possible that one of or many of these channels are not good, but some of the other ones will be good because they would be inherently uncorrelated and thereby we can use different diversity combining techniques to get diversity gains. But we will move back into our information theoretic concept and if you look at these slides again, I have put together this CISO, CIMO, MISO and MIMO four possible combinations. But please note these are generally waveform channels. So, I have put the title as XI, XO standing for these four combinations. Now, we come back to channel capacity. So, the capacity of a discrete memoryless channel is defined as the maximum average mutual information in any single use of the channel, where the maximization is over all input probabilities. So, if you look at C, which is the capacity, I maximize it over all possible input probabilities and this is the average mutual information and these expressions are easily obtained from the channel transition probability matrix. What it tells us is having observed y at the output, what can you really say about x being transmitted? Now, that answer would depend on the input probabilities. Why? Because suppose the channel treats 0 differently than 1, it makes more errors for 0 versus 1, then the probabilities have to be adjusted to get the maximum out of this channel. Wherever the channel is weak, suppose it does not treat 0 very well, it makes lots of errors, I should have fewer number of zeros. And if the channel treats 1 very well, it rarely makes a mistake for 1, I should have more number of 1s as in the input. So, I can optimize the input distribution to get the maximum average mutual information over this channel. So, let us look at some properties. The first one is obvious, it is the maximum of the average mutual information. Now, since average mutual information is always greater than or equal to 0, the capacity must necessarily be greater than or equal to 0. This is a relief because uh, every time I use the channel, the units will bits per use and worst, the channel is broken and it does not communicate any information. So, it is 0. But even if the channel is doing any meaningful job, my capacity would be greater than 0. But it can never be negative, it does not make sense. Okay. Now, if you remember, this average mutual information can be written as i x semicolon y is equal to h of x minus h of x given y. So, if you recall, alternatively you can also write as h of y minus h of y given x. So, clearly you can conclude that this is the minus part. So, if you look at it your c should be less than or equal to log of cardinality of x from here, right? because this is the maximum I can have for h of x. So, mutual information at best can reach the maximum attainable value for h of x and this happens when x has equiprobable outcomes and at that case the entropy of x becomes log to the base 2, the cardinality of x. So, it necessarily must be less than or equal to um, log cardinality of x. At the same time, I can have 
c less than or equal to log y. This, this is the same logic. At worst, I will subtract something out of it. If these are independent, then I get the 0 and the maximum attainable value is h of y and when outcome are equally probable, then I get log cardinality of y. So, in any case your average mutual information is upper bounded by these two values. Okay. So, this is what we see in this uh, slide uh, this property of channel capacity. So, this is a sanity check if you have done a lengthy calculation and quickly you are getting a value which is not consistent it is greater than log of cardinality of x or log of cardinality of y you immediately must check your answer. Now, we look at some special cases some very friendly channels. So, we talk about symmetric channel and weakly symmetric channels in this slide. So, a discrete memoryless channel is said to be symmetric if the rows of the channel transition probability matrix are permutations of each other and so are the columns. Whereas, a weakly symmetric channel is such that the, the rows of the channel probability matrix are permutation while the column sums are equal. Why is this important? Because for weakly symmetric channels, the capacity can simply be written as log of y, cardinality of y minus h of rho of transition matrix. This is actually you can if you look a little hard is this is h y given x that is the answer to this one. So, let us look at a simple example. Consider this channel which we hope is symmetric, but we can always test it out. So, what is the test? Well, the test is that a symmetric channel the rows of the channel transition probability matrix are permutations. So, if you look at row 1, row 2 and row 3 they are just permutations of each other. If you look at the columns column 1, column 2, column 3 they are also permutations of each other. So, rows of the channel probability matrix are permutations and so are the columns. So, clearly this is a symmetric channel. what is the question? The question is whether they are unique permutation, they are just permutations. So, you just standard 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.5 and so on and so forth. Each row also must have to add to 1. Yes. Now, let us look at another simple example. This is an example for a weakly symmetric channel. So, here what is interesting is that the input there are two input symbols and there are three possible output symbols and they are connected with this channel transition uh, values. And if you look at it the rows of the channel transition probability matrix are permutations. So, if you see half 1 by 6, 1 by 3 this is 1 by 6 half 1 by 3 and I can have several such permutations possible and this is the step 1. Check 1 is satisfied the rows of the transition probability matrix are permutations, but do the columns add up to some same value. So, 1 by 2 plus 1 by 6 is 2 by 3, 1 by 6 plus 1 by 2 is again 2 by 3, 1 by 3 plus 1 by 3 is again 2 by 3. So, the column sums are equal and hence we can easily write it as a weakly symmetric channels. Sir, but how the transition matrix is formed by seeing the channel or input output probability? Okay. So, the question being asked is how is a channel transition probability matrix found? how do we ascertain it? It is a pretty simple way to do it. We can do it experimentally or by simulations. So, let us look at this example. Suppose, I have a channel, it could be a wireless channel, so that we can all relate to it. So, there is a transmitter and then there is a receiver. Okay. And we say that if the amplitude is if amplitude 
of x t is greater than 4 volts, we say it 1 if x t less than minus 4 volts, we say it as 0 and suppose it is anywhere in between, we say it is an erasure. Right? So, this is my rule. So, I carry out lot of experiments. So, I say randomly I sent a million ones. What is a one? It is a waveform with an amplitude greater than 4 or 5, whatever I wish to transmit. And at the decoder, I take a call and I do a count. So, for every one that I sent, so I am transmitting a 0 or a 1, but what I receive is a 0 erasure or a 1 depending upon these three conditions. So, this is the decoder side. So, decoder will use one of these three rules to say and measure. So, I know what pseudo random bit sequence I am sending at the transmitter and I find out what is the decision it is taking. So, it is possible that half the time when I sent a 0, it is actually received as a 0. So, I write half, but what happens to the other half of the time? Right? So, well, I say that okay, one third of the time when I send a 0, it lands up at 1. How does it know? Well, the, the transmitter knows what it is sending, the receiver figures out what it decoded, they compare notes and then they calculate on an average one third of the time it lands up as a 1, what was sent a 0. So, we get 1 by 3 as the transition probability 0 to 1. And what happens the rest of the one sixth of the time? Well, it is an erasure. So, I write 1 by 6 here. And I can do the same experiment with my 1. So, I transmit hundreds of thousands of 1s and I see how many times actually 1 is received over this channel. And maybe it is 1 by 3. 1 by 2, 1 by 6, it would be anything. And then I write down my channel transition probability matrix. Okay? So, I can do it experimentally or I can make a MATLAB program for my channel model. So, I can plug in my channel model, it could be a Rayleigh fading model or a Rishian model or a simple Gaussian model with additive wide Gaussian noise and I can conduct this experiment and see what are the numbers I get. So, getting this channel transition probability matrix is easy, I can do it by measurement or by simulations. And needless to say, if I make my channel more hostile if it is a poor channel, I plug in more noise, I will start making more errors and this transition probability matrix values will change. So, coming back to our uh, example, we observe that the second uh, matrix is weakly symmetric and we already know what is the capacity for weakly symmetric channels and I am curious to find this out for this guy and for weakly symmetric channels, it is log cardinality of y minus h rho of transition matrix. What is h? h is like half log to the base 2 1 by 2 plus 1 by 6 log to the base 2 1 by 6 plus 1 by 3 log to the base 1 by 3 with a negative sign in, in the front and I will get a certain value. In this particular case, it is 0.1258 bits. Physically, what does it mean? It means 
that on an average having observed y, we can only communicate 0.1258 bits of information over this channel. This is what is it worth. I can again look at this and note that even if I make any transitions, so even if I juggle them, make a permutation of it, it still remains weakly symmetric and nothing will change. So, I can make this as 1 by 6, 1 by 3, 1 by 2 and still the capacity will not change because this h of rows of transition matrix will not change. Because for the receiver, it does not matter whether I call this as a 0 erasure and 1 or 0, 1 erasure, it does not matter. It is just two symbols being received as 3. Now, let us look at this noisy channel coding theorem. So, let us have a discrete memoryless source with an alphabet x. So, alphabet is a set of symbols with entropy h of x. So, clearly we know the probabilities of occurrences of each of the symbols. Now, we have introduced this parameter T s every second because we are tired of saying per use. So, we would like to bring in this time component and we say that this channel, the source is generating a symbol every T s second. Whereas, what we have is a channel with capacity C, now we know what is C and this channel is used once every T c second. Then if H x over T s which is the source rate and C over T c is how frequently we are using the channel. So, capacity divided by the time we use the channel. If we have the condition that C over T c is greater than H x over T s, then there exists a coding scheme. What is this coding scheme? It is an error control coding scheme. What is an error control coding scheme? I have a smart way of adding redundancy in a known manner. Please recall, in source coding, we were removing the redundancy. In channel coding, we are adding redundancy though in a known manner. We will have a mathematical structure. The noise does not know about the structure. So, noise at random flips bits and using that mathematical or the algebraic structure, I should be able to reconstruct the code. That is in a layman's language what a coding scheme does. Coding scheme is error control coding scheme. Sometimes this is also called as channel coding scheme because the errors are introduced by the channel. So, coming back to the noisy channel coding theorem, it says that if the source rate h of x divided by t of s is less than this magical quantity c over t c, then there exists a coding scheme for which the output can be transmitted over this unreliable noisy channel and can be reconstructed with an arbitrarily low probability of error. How low? you define it. 10 to the power minus 10, 10 to the power minus 15, be my guest. You can go ahead and do that. Conversely, if we have the source rate h of x divided by T s greater than c over T c, then sorry we cannot guarantee you much, you cannot really pin down the probability of error. So, this interesting parameter c over t c is called the critical rate. It figures out here. So, if you are less than the critical rate, you are in business. On the other hand, if you exceed this critical rate, sorry, pray hard because your probability of error cannot be pinned down. Okay. So, this is a very important result. It puts in a fundamental limit on the rate at which reliable communication is possible over an unreliable channel. Right? But the sad part is that it tells us about the existence of these codes, but it does not give us a recipe to construct these codes. 
So we still have to look hard and find and keep our research going regarding finding better and better codes. Since these codes, we do not have a formula, a method, a recipe to come up with these codes, those guys who come, came up with very good codes got their names attached to it. So, we will see to it, we will come to Hamming code, Reed Solomon code, Reed Solomon code, Reed Miller code and several other code. So, all the inventors got the credit because there is no hard and fast rule to really construct it. There are some rules, but in general it has relied on the ingenuity of the inventor. So, let us look at a simple example. Let us have a simple discrete memoryless source that has equally likely outputs. So, memoryless source, it is a binary source. So, every t s seconds, it throws out a 1 or a 0. So, it could be my friend tossing a fair coin okay? and every time he sees a head, he says 1, every time he sees a tail, he says 0 and so on and so forth. But he has been instructed to toss the coin and report the result every t s seconds. Now, we know very well that the entropy of this binary source is 1 bit. Okay? It is the maximum possible value because both the outcomes are equally likely. So, the information rate of this source is simply entropy divided by T s is 1 over T s bits per second. So, this is the entropy, the source rate of, of this guy and we call this as the information rate. Now, this guy who is generating this 1s and zeros, my source wishes to transmit this over a noisy channel. The source sequence is applied to the channel coder with code rate r. Now, what is this code rate r? Suppose we have certain k bits of data to be transmitted. So, suppose I have this k bits. So, my channel encoder will add n minus k redundant bits and convert it into a longer bit stream. So, n is greater than k and this code rate r is equal to k over n. This is the code rate we are referring to it will become obvious why we need to use this code rate shortly. Okay. So, this channel encoder's job is to pad or introduce redundant bits, how many? n minus k, so that it is able to recover from errors. Now, let us go back to the slide and we see that the source sequence is applied to a channel coder with code rate r. This channel code is used to uses the channel every one t c seconds to send the coded sequence. So, what we do is this channel coding theorem says that if I have to do reliable communication, then the source rate 1 over t s should be necessarily less than or equal to c over t c. Now, C is the channel capacity I need to find out, but what do we mean by C over T C? If you juggle this, I get one over T S is necessarily less than or equal to C over T C for me to conduct communication reliably, but if you look at it, it means T c over T s should be less than or equal to c. But what is my T c? T c is the rate at which I use the channel. Now, clearly this T 
T c should be less than T s. Why is it so? Because my source is generating k bits, but I have to transmit n bits, n is greater than k. So, that I avoid the overflow in the time that my source is generating k bits, I should be able to pump out n bits, but who decides how fast am I using the channel? Well, I am using the channel once every t c seconds and how fast is my friend generating those bits t s. So, the only way I can have this t c less than t s is when I can pump out more number of bits than what the channel encoder is getting. But what is this ratio? This ratio is nothing but r because if you look at it right. So, I send k bits in T s and n bits in T c. So, every T c second I use the channel. Right? So, this is nothing but T c over T s. So, if you look at it we can write r less than or equal to c. So, coming back to the slide the condition for reliable communication can be written as r the code rate r which is the ratio of before channel encoder to after channel encoder necessary less than 1 is less than or equal to c. So, we continue with this example consider this binary symmetric channel with probability of error 10 is to the minus p. So, 1 in every 100 bits gets flipped. So, this is a typical error rate of a wireless channel. So, for a binary symmetric channel we have the capacity we already calculated it as 1 minus h p and this is the binary entropy function with a negative sign and if you plug in the value of p is equal to 0 0.01 you get a capacity 0.919. Okay. So, with this low probability of error this channel capacity tells us that we can use this channel every single time and effectively transmit 0 0.919 bits. So, we know that from the previous example we conclude that there exists at least one coding scheme with rate less than 0 0.919 which will guarantee me arbitrarily low error rates. So, for this simple channel. Okay. Now, how do we get this? What is the best way to pad or add redundancy to get this 0 0.919? Let us just understand the import of this. So, what we have seen is for reliable communication we have seen that your r should be less than or equal to 0.919. Okay. So, just for the sake of discussion let us say it is 0.9. What does this mean? It means that my friend the channel encoder which is supposed to pad or introduce redundancy can take 9 bits and give out 10 bits, then I have r equal to 0.9. So, possibly it is adding a parity bit fine or it can take 90 bits and throw out 100 bits. Again I meet the condition. but this is a more complex encoder because there are many more ways of adding 10 bits to 90 bits than adding 1 bit to 90 bits or you can keep this argument going I can take 900 bits add 100 bits and make it 1000 bits 
again uh, my r is equal to 0 0.9. So, this is my encoder 2, encoder 3 and so on and so forth. I do not have a recipe, nobody tells me how to add the bits, what is the best way to do things. This is my problem. I know all of this methods, there is a some way to add 1 bit to 9 bits or 10 bits to 90 bits or 100 bits to 900 bits and I will be able to get as low probability of error as possible, but how, where to add, what is the best way to do it, maybe this may not do or we have to figure things out, what is the best way to do it. So, it is like for 1 bit we have to map with 1.1 bit and then send it. Question being asked is where does the TC part figure into this? We assumed. So, the assumption of TC was that we are going to, if you look at this diagram again, it says that once every TC seconds, but I can scale these ratios again. So, if I have to use 10 k bits as input and 10 n bits, then this T C s and T s both go down by 1 by 10, it does not really make a difference, it is a ratio which is important, fine. So, that is not the point. So, coming back to our example, suppose we use a repetition code, repetition code simply tells you that every bit is repeated n times. So, for example, if I have to send a 0, I do not send simply a 0, I send a 0, 0, 0. If I have to send a 1, I do not send a 1, I send a 1, 1, 1. So, this is a repetition code of length 3, it is also called block length, n small n is the block size and it is a simple block code. So, for n is equal to 5, 0 is sent not as a 0, but it is repeated 5 times. 1 is not sent as a 1 repeat it 5 times. Right. So, the code rate is 1 over n, where n is the length of the block code. Now, what is the decoding strategy? Well, a, a simple decoding strategy is the majority uh, decoding strategy, where whatever you receive, you count the number of 1s or zeros. If the number of 1s exceeds zeros, you declare a 1 was sent, if the number of zeros exceed 1, then declare 0 was sent, because the probability of flipping of more 1s than zeros will skew the decision in the other direction. This also tells you why n typically is odd for repetition code. So, if n is odd, n is equal to 2 m plus 1, where m is a positive integer and we use this majority decoding logic huh? and let us assume that the a priority, a priority probabilities of 1s and zeros are equal, then we can always write the average probability of error as follows. Well, it is a sum of mutually exclusive events, error will happen, error means despite using this repetition code, you will end up making mistakes. When will it make a mistake? if more than half plus 1 bits are in error. So, m plus 1 bits are in error and they can be permutated as follows or m plus 2 bits are in error going up to all the n bits are in errors. All these cases the this repetition code will make a mistake. We will go over this example in greater detail, but just to understand this point and relating it to the noisy channel coding theorem, you look at this code rates, code rate r is equal to 1 means you are not using any error control code, you are not repeating it at all. So, it is a raw probability of error. If you do 1 by 3, your probability of error is going down. Repetition code of length 5 gone down 4 orders of magnitude, we have hope. Somewhere Shannon promised that we could have arbitrarily low probability of error and we are getting that and it 
appears that we have a strategy going with this repetition code. The only sad part is this code rate is also grow, going to close to 0. Shannon never said that code rate must also go to 0, it said that it should only be less than c. c was just 0 0.9 and here we have dropped to 0 0.33, 0 0.20, 0 0.15, 0 0.11, it is dropping drastically something is wrong or this is just a toy example, it is not good enough, we can find better codes than that. Okay, so, these are the observation that the probability of error is decreasing rapidly, right? but the for the repetition code, if we want to have smaller and smaller probability of error, the code rate is also falling, but the code rate need not tend to 0, that is the bottom line the channel coding theorem, the biggest contribution is that you can have very efficient codes where the code rate need not tend to 0 in order to obtain arbitrarily low probabilities of error. So, repetition code was an example, but probably not the best way to illustrate how we can tie it to the channel coding theorem. Now, very quickly we will talk about the Gaussian channel and this is just a precursor to our next lecture, where we will look at the uh, channel capacity of a Gaussian channel. So, just let us have a quick view on this um, Gaussian channel. So, x k is the input and z k is the noise and we get the output. Now, this z k is drawn from a Gaussian distribution with mean 0 and variance sigma square. We are curious to find out what is the capacity of this Gaussian channel, but we will take up this problem in the subsequent class. So, in summary we have looked at the different kinds of channel, channel models. Right, starting from binary symmetric channel to discrete memoryless channel, we have looked at the channel coding theorem and we have discussed some examples and found out the need for a, an error control code and why this code rate must be less than 1. And we linked it to the rate at which we use the channel and linked it to the source rate. So, with that we come to the end of um, our lecture and we will take it up in the next class.